Hello everyone and welcome. I'm Sarah Shaffey and it's lovely to be here. Welcome to the bottom drawer books that changed my life a series that is part of the Bagri Foundation's change theme for 2021. For this second season we're featuring writers whose UK debuts have just been published and we're asking them about the books that inspired them to write including their earliest efforts and moments or books that changed their life as well as of course talking to them about their current novel. And I'm really excited about talking to Rahul Reina today about his book How to Kidnap the Rich as well as his writing journey. Rahul divides his time between Oxford and Delhi. He runs his own startup in England for part of the year and works for charities for street children and teaches English in India in the down season. Um, and of course, How to Kidnap the Rich um, is his debut novel. So welcome, Rahul. How are you? I'm very good, Sarah. Hi, lovely to talk to you. Uh, and let's begin by getting you to tell us what kidnap, How to Kidnap the Rich um, is about. Sure, so it's set in modern India, it's set in modern Delhi, and it's set in and around the world of exam scams. So we have our main character who's come from a really poor background and to make his way in modern India, he gets sucked into the world of exam scams and taking exams for kind of rich boys who are kind of a bit lazy. They come from really rich families, but they're, they, they just can't be bothered to put a shift in. And he, so what he does is that he acts as a double. He acts as a double for these boys. And in the course of the novel, he accidentally comes top of the exam. And uh, when that happens, you just enter into this crazy world of privilege and riches and wealth and danger. And that's what we have, you know, a journey in this novel in India from the bottom to the top. Yeah, I definitely want to talk about that slightly wild journey that um, Ramesh, who is the, the main character, and, and Rudy, the person who he takes the exam as, go on. Um, but I'd love to talk to you about the inspiration from this book, because it actually was inspired by something in real life, but that wasn't happening in India, that happened elsewhere, that's right, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's been, uh, it was, I mean, the sort of impetus to write it came from definitely from the American college exam scandal in 2019, where we had, you know, this crazy situation where we had, you know, Hollywood parents and kind of rich multimillionaire, multi-billionaire parents shepherding their kids through the American college system by getting people to take their exams for them by finding the little kind of hidden nooks and crannies in the American college system and finding, you know, these sports coaches who could be bribed into saying, oh, you know, my son or daughter is the best lacrosse player in the world. Please take them into my mm -hmm. university. And what happened is that when that happened, so many of my friends from India pretty much kind of were just talking nonstop day after day about this is so much like what our life is like here, you know, we have, you know, so many rich people who cheat their way through the exam system by just getting their kids into these little programs or by getting other people to take their exams for them or leaking exam papers to them or just bribing teachers. And they were like, this is exactly what life is like here. So I was like, yeah, why not write something that kind of speaks to both halves of my life, to the Indian side and to the more kind of Western side? So um, as we heard, your focus is largely on two characters. So Ramesh, who's in his sort of early, early 20s, and Rudy, who is 18, 19 or so, kind of on that cusp of like the going to university type age. Um, can you talk about how you went about forming the two of them and getting their distinct personalities on, down on the page? Because they are, in a lot of ways, very, very different, although they find themselves stuck together and dealing with the same situation throughout the book. Yeah, sure. So, I mean, Rudy is a character who's more close in terms of background to people that I know and to me myself. Uh, he's basically essentially all of my male Indian friends at the age of about 18 or 19 in terms of what he likes, in terms of the ways that he behaves, in the ways that he's quite prideful and arrogant, but kind of underneath all of that, he's actually quite, you know, he's just looking for connection. He's looking for somebody to really like him. You know, especially in India nowadays, we have young people, teenagers, young men who really have big problems with mental health. And they just don't know how to talk about these things because that sort of system of talking about things just doesn't exist there. It, I mean, it doesn't even exist in this country really that much. Mm -hmm. So that's Rudy. He's like meant to be like a sort of archetypal, spoiled, rich, upper middle class Indian boy. I know so many of those people. I'm not one of them myself, but I know so many of them. Uh, and Ramesh is more he's based around sort of the, the sort of the kids that I've met uh, doing charity work in India in that he 
wants to make a name for himself. He wants to make a life for himself, but he's just totally cut out of modern India's huge wealth creation machine. You know, we've had, you know, the top incomes in our country go up five or 10 times in the last 20 or 30 years. And we have hundreds of millions of people who are just totally cut out from that. So that's what I wanted. And I wanted it to be set in Delhi, you know, my city, which has got some of the richest people in India, but also has these parts, like in old Delhi, where Ramesh comes from, where, you know, people have lived in poverty for hundreds of years and will probably live in poverty for hundreds of years more. Mm. Those those contrasts, you can really see those in, especially when we hear about Ramesh's past and his sort of story unravels and his dad um, is essentially a, a tea seller and, and Ramesh, it's really by sort of chance that he is set on a path to, to schooling and to education because he's a very clever child but doesn't necessarily have the opportunities that Rudy does and perhaps Rudy squanders them in some ways I guess. Yeah absolutely he squanders them you know if if you're a rich if you're a rich kid in India today you are living in absolutely the best time that you've ever lived in to be a young Indian person in terms of how easy it is to get jobs and money and how quickly you can transfer your skills straight away to the west and start working for American companies or British companies in America or Britain or wherever um, and for me, part of the sort of the tension in the book is to talk about what life is like for Indian millennials versus Western millennials, because especially in literature, uh, Western millennials, you know, we have so many novels about them being sort of anomic and atomized and being kind of shut out from modern Western society and about having, you know, so many people making money, but about Western millennials being, you know, living worse lives than their parents. And I want to talk about Indian millennials who are living far better lives than their parents ever have, I mean, ever could have dreamt of. So that's part of what I was trying to talk about as well. Mm. So the book is written from Ramesh's perspective, and I wondered if that was always going to be the case or if you ever played around with sort of other voices, and perhaps, perhaps Rudy or perhaps someone else or a, a sort of a more third person kind of voice at all. Um, definitely not third person. I'm really not attracted to the third person as a thing. And I think in terms of what I was looking for when I was writing the book, it was speed, uh, speed above all other things. I think that's really what characterizes India today in terms of people's rises and falls. And I just felt that that had to be really kind of hit on the head in the narrative. And that had to come through in the narrative voice. And for me, the third person was just not so useful in doing that. So yeah, it had to be fast. It had to be kind of funny, it had to be aggressive, it had to be kind of passionate. And for me, that was a first person voice. And it's difficult to do that with uh, Rudy, the more rich character, because his life has always been one of privilege. You know, he's always grown up wealthy. He knows that in the future he's going to be wealthy, whatever happens. And his parents are going to make sure that that's going to happen, which is why they hired an exam double. So for me, that's much less of an interesting perspective than uh, Ramesh who comes from poverty and goes into the world of wealth and you see that massive change that's what I wanted to really talk about so yeah it had to be I, I felt always from the perspective of Ramesh because Rudy is yeah R Rudy doesn't see the privilege of the world that he lives in he doesn't realize the world that he lives in whereas for Ramesh it's very obvious how this new India is very different from the old India that he comes from it's interesting that you mentioned speed there because as you were talking about it I was thinking about the novel and how rapidly everything does happen there's sort of this beginning bit where Ramesh meets Rudy and his parents and and you know is studying but then once he gets that top score you are on this incredibly fast journey to basically the top you know there's a reality tv show there's sponsorship deals there's parties there's there's drugs and it does all happen at such a clip is that really a reflection of kind of India today where everything is moving and developing you so fast I mean you were talking about how you know Indian millennials are living better lives than their parents and that is something that I guess has happened that change in the economy that change in the class system has I guess happened really really fast yeah absolutely I mean especially in Delhi you see it in every aspect of society you know homes that were 10 years ago they were about five or six hundred thousand pounds uh, in English money today are like 15 million pounds so the explosion in wealth that's happened even from the mid 2000s has been insane you know my grandparents when they lived in Delhi in the 80s 
uh, they lived in a city where there were about 3 million people and today there are about 40 million people. So it's a place that has changed absolutely beyond kind of imagination, especially in the 90s. You know, we had we opened ourselves up from our old socialized planned economy into, you know, the big world of globalization. So, you know, even I remember, you know, 1996, 1997, I was young enough to remember that there was no McDonald's, there were no foreign cars, there was no, you know, it really felt as if India was totally shut off from the world. And now it just feels like it's part of the modern world. So yeah, th that sense of speed totally mirrors what's happened in India for so many people, but then for so many people, their India hasn't changed. And that's what I was trying to talk about. For, for poor people, they might as well be living, you know, in the 1950s or 1960s in, in how close they are to these sources of wealth that come from outside and have permeated into our society. I guess that's kind of one of the things about Ramesh as well is that um, at no point does he sort of think I've made it and I am comfortable and this is good he's always he's still got that mind mentality of like the situation that he grew up in and the class and the, and the poverty that he grew up in of kind of this could disappear at any moment so let's let's sort of get everything done as quickly as possible and and not let it slip through our hands um I wanted to talk a little bit about Ramesh and, and Rudy as sort of anti-heroes of a sort because Ramesh essentially makes his living really by lying and cheating and obviously that is because there are people willing to pay him to do that and and Rudy is like you know pretty selfish and spoiled maybe yeah an average kind of 18 year old guy with sort of disposable income in India and there were numerous times when I wanted to scream at the both of them but many many more occasions when I was on their side even when they were being quite ridiculous or you sort of saw them saw them getting themselves into the situations that they did what do you think the appeal is of kind of the anti-hero in, in fiction and were you writing them as as archetypal anti-heroes or were you just writing these these characters that were composites of kind of people or types of people that you knew um i think it's both things i mean definitely i mean from my perspective on the novel they are anti-heroes but when i was writing it i was very much writing it as they are the heroes of their own lives they're creating everything that happens for them um obviously anti-heroes in Western fiction and Indian fiction, I mean, they are, you know, they are such a huge part of the stories that we tell ourselves. Um, Indian fiction is absolutely obsessed with the idea of characters who break through boundaries, who kind of, uh, who kind of force their, force themselves on a system that doesn't believe about, uh, believe in them or care about them. And, you know, the anti-hero is such, is such an easy way to convey that. Um, and especially currently, uh, especially currently, for example, in in Western novels, the anti-hero is such a huge part of of you know kind of modern millennial literature. So that's kind of what I wanted to also talk about. Um, what we see today, especially in the West, in terms of the novels that we have, is again that sense of that we are meant to be living in like the world's biggest meritocracy. What you do in terms of exams and what you do in terms of jobs is what is based upon the sort of person that you are, but that we have to create these new and different identities and identities that might not be, shall we say, kind of moral to make us uh, uh, to make our ways in the world. So yeah, that's uh, that's definitely what I want to talk about: the sense of morality and amorality versus the sort of societies that we live in and the lies that we tell ourselves about the sort of worlds that we live in. Mm. In a sort of very basic sense, I think it's interesting because some of that sort of morality or amorality does come from the society. So it's interesting that we've been talking about the fact that um, the book is about Rudy or Ramesh rather coming first in the exams that he's taken, but actually he doesn't come first. He comes second, but the guy that comes first is a Muslim. So essentially you're told he doesn't count can you talk a little bit about about that and that sort of um that sort of politics that is part of the novel in that really light touch kind of way yeah uh you are you are the first person to mention that so i'd like to thank you very much for mentioning that yeah absolutely that was meant to be that's meant to be like a little grenade of a sentence hidden in the middle of the novel and like people just kind of gloss over it sometimes absolutely 
Yeah, exactly. I mean, for me, dealing with political concerns and stuff like that, you should deal with it. Uh, you should sort of put it in a way that's shocking to the reader. And I felt that was really the most shocking way to put it. You know, he didn't come top, he came second. But it's so easy to erase people in India today. You can just you can just shut them out. You can just shut them out of the conversation. You can shut them out of wealth. You can shut them out of the media so easily. So yeah, that's definitely that was definitely contained within 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 the structure of the novel because that's what Indian society is like. Uh, and absolutely, and I'd like to thank you very much for picking up on that. And yeah, absolutely. I mean, I just wanted to talk about marginalization because mm. because because that's what India can be like, you know, for hundreds and hundreds of millions of people. And I've talked a lot about wealth and I've talked a lot about about kind of changing India and about changing societies. But what's incredible about India today is how much so much of that wealth that we've bought for ourselves and we've made for ourselves has gone into keeping the systems exactly as they were and for kind of making sure that our society never changes. And yeah, that's that's one of the tragedies of modern India, that we can change the physical world, but we can't change our own mental selves. I guess part of that does come down to politics though because and, and this is something else you do use in the novel there's sort of um some parts later where essentially um Ramesh and Rudy are kind of framed as the bad guys in the narrative and in order to do that Rudy is basically pitched as a Pakistani spy and and it's that idea of kind of this um this sort of almost unseen enemy it's not because it's you know that you share a border India shares a border with Pakistan but it's the idea of this unseen enemy that is then used to kind of in some ways progress India and in some ways hold back the people that are perhaps marginalized hold them back even more is that kind of the case and and sort of I mean it's a very funny part in the book where where kind of people are like well he's obviously a Pakistani spy and and it's presented in a very funny way but then when you think about it it does have these kind of much deeper ramifications. You know absolutely I, I mean as a country uh, we spend so much of our time focusing on Pakistan focusing on you know, terrorism that doesn't exist across, you know, about, you know, guns flowing across the border. And if we didn't do that, I think, you know, our, you know, India would be in a much, much better place. Um, what you find in India today is a media complex that is just obsessed, that is just obsessed with treating any change in the status quo as something that's been kind of created and foisted upon us by enemies outside. And the easiest enemy and the ones that they and, and, and the one that they always find is is Pakistan. So yeah, I again that's another thing that I just wanted to deal with in a more kind of lighthearted satirical way, but I always wanted there to be a danger. I always wanted there to be a physical danger to them uh, and an emotional danger as well of being kind of exposed and destroyed on the biggest scale possible. And what I wanted to talk about also is that lives in India today can be so cheap. You know, these two boys, Ramesh and Rudy, they would be on one day's news cycle. And for them, their whole lives would be destroyed and their lives would never be the same again. But for the politicians and for the powerful people in India, it would be a one day news cycle. They'd whip up outrage, they'd whip up riots, they'd whip up storms and lynchings. And then for them, the next day would be totally fine because there's no sense of accountability right at the top. So, yeah, that's what I want to talk about as well. I mean, we do see that with a with another character, and I don't want to spoil anything, but that character is exactly like you say. It's there. It's you know, it's a few hours of his life, and for him, it's it's everything, and it destroys it destroys his life. It destroys his sense of self, and it, and it leads to kind of quite a lot of the action of the novel. Um, and I found I just found that so interesting because I think. That, you know, we see that here as well. We see that across the world where somebody says something on social media and then and their life is kind of destroyed by the reaction, but everybody else moves on the next day or, or a week later. I mean, how conscious were you? This is very much a novel about India in a particular moment or, and sort of the journey that India has been on and perhaps where it's going but how conscious were you that it's it is also saying things about the world at, at large as well uh, I mean always conscious always conscious you know um I 
I, I wrote this novel in India, but I kind of edited it after I'd left India and kind of edited it in, in Britain. So I was always conscious of the fact that I was living between these two places and that the novel was also speaking to, to two different worlds. You know, just in terms of the publishing industry, obviously this novel had to go to British agents and to British publishers to find its way out in the world. You know, as an Indian writer, you always know that. You know that getting things published through Indian channels or subcontinental channels will never get you into the sort of places that our big writers come from, because our big writers have always been people who've gone to the West, published their novels there, and then their novels have come back to us. So that sense of mirroring things between the West and India is just totally, I mean, it's, it is a part of the novel's DNA. And yeah, what you were talking about, uh, talking about this, yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's the way that the system is like. And to me, that's a huge part of what India is like today in that people are going to have to recognize their similarities across borders and across, you know, the worlds of literature. You know, we can't keep on living in this world where we're all Indian novels about kind of mystical mangoes and spices and elephants and cows and all that sort of stuff, because that's not the way that the world is. And if you're looking for literature like that, then what you're asking is to be pandered to. And I'm not interested in pandering to people. I'm interested in telling people what things are like as well as I can. Yeah. And you, you do that. You mentioned um, the word, I think, satirical earlier. And this is this is a, a satire and you do use it to address. I mean, we've talked about wealth and class. Um, we've talked about, I guess, nationalism in a way. Colorism is in there as well. Quite a bit. There's like quite a few sort of comments woven throughout. Um, and those are, you know, some pretty big things. And you do a really good job of making us as readers laugh and then stop in our tracks and realize that what we're laughing at isn't really funny in real life um are you naturally drawn towards a kind of a satirical writing style and what satire enables you to do with the things that you want to be talking about and looking at yeah absolutely absolutely i feel that yes absolutely i think part of what happened is that when i was a kid and my family came over <laughs> Uh, came over to Britain was that my parents pretty much told me that you know we're we're here to make money right we're here in the west because they give you money to do things and in India they don't do that so I feel that really from a really young age I've been encouraged by my family to take a slightly more jaundiced view of societal relations especially in Britain than I would have you know if I was from sli a slightly more normal immigrant family you know we're from Kashmir where Kashmiris, we have that sense of playfulness and verbal kind of dexterity, and that we're from this really small place, we're a really small hermetic society, we think that we're better than everyone else, and we just like to take the piss out of people who are kind of, well, anyone else, because we're from Kashmir, we're from paradise on earth, we're better than you, and the rest of India is just kind of, yeah, and the rest of the world apparently as well. Apparently that's also that's also what our worldview extends to. So yeah, I'm definitely interested in satire, and I'm definitely interested in kind of poking, poking at so uh, uh, poking at society because I think yeah, that's that's just my family background. Yeah, you mentioned earlier that you wrote the novel um, in India and edited it in the UK. Can you tell us a little bit more about the writing of of this book and sort of how how it came together? Like, was it a sort of very not easy book to write but was it one where you sat down and and it sort of all just came and and then you obviously had the editing process afterwards or was it kind of one that you had to agonize about for years and, and sort of go back and forth with uh so I mean I wrote it in in my grandmother's house in Delhi and my grandmother's house in Delhi she's a very traditional woman so the wi-fi is like 100 kilobytes per second it's awful <laughs> She doesn't believe in air conditioners. She barely believes in fans. So it was very hot. It was very noisy. Uh, my internet didn't work. So a huge part of the novel comes from that. It comes from the sense of speed and me just kind of putting everything into the text itself. So yeah, if this novel feels hot and it feels crowded and it feels fast, that's basically where that came from. Of just kind of me kind of just busting through the chapters like that of kind of sitting down in the morning and just writing for like eight hours and then I came up and I was you know you know exactly that was that was what the day was like yeah so 
a lot of the speed and the ease of writing comes from the physical circumstances that I was writing in the book. You know, I had a Bluetooth keyboard, I had a tablet and I was like, let's just write this. So yeah, absolutely. That's what a lot of that comes from. And then I left India, went back to Britain, uh, had about a week's break where I was just kind of getting my head together. And then I kind of edited it at a slightly more sedate pace in Britain where everything is kind of quiet, where, you know, nothing is hot. Nobody's shouting at you kind of every five seconds. And yeah, exactly. Yeah. Mm. What was the editing process like? Did anything sort of major change through that editing process? Or, or is the novel that we see pretty much the novel that you first sat down and wrote? Uh, no, because um, I mean, the, the first draft was, you know, the usual sort of vomit draft where you just chuck things onto the page and let's see if it works. But again, that's part of what I felt India was like. I mean, you kind of have to start at the beginning and you have to finish at the end and you have to go through it as quickly as you can because otherwise you get stuck in stuff and you just get lost in the weeds and it will never complete itself. So yeah, that, that first draft was about 50,000 words and the scenes weren't complete. The characters didn't have names. There were kind of odd point of view problems. Uh, so, so, so that second draft, which I did in Britain, was really, really, really useful. It was about uh, 70,000 words and everything was more fleshed out. You know, the scenes had proper beginnings and endings. The characters had proper names. Uh, their kind of sense of uh, kind of uh, their sense of cohesiveness as characters was totally maintained throughout. So, yeah, I definitely needed that week to step away and to kind of get it properly done whereas I mean normally agents and publishers and stuff they say take six weeks take six weeks out from your first draft your second draft no but for me a week is enough India's you're you know, working on you're working on India time here there's no six weeks you're like a week and I'm done that is for six weeks <laughs> exactly exactly six weeks that's for that's for British people that's for Americans for me one week I don't need any of this nonsense yeah that's fine also I have a very bad memory so I just forgot what I've written yeah um, what is the, have you got other books that you have written prior to this that are sitting in a drawer somewhere or the, or the digital equivalent of a desk drawer? Yeah, so I have a absolutely disastrous 2018 novel, which is about 150,000 words long and is about, uh, is essentially kind of set around post-Brexit Britain and set around the kind of the political system and the media world and about kind of young people, young men and women wake, making their way through the world and kind of selling themselves out and doing whatever they can to get ahead. And I wrote that in 2018. It took me much, much longer than this. It took me, I think, about eight or nine months of kind of doing four or five hours a day. And yes, uh, it was a disaster, but it taught me a hell of a lot about writing. Well, you know, ask, what, what did it teach you that you were able to use with, with this book? Um, I think it taught me that what I valued most in novels was speed, was in terms of getting the setup, getting the thing done and then moving, you know, getting scene, 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 scene like that, making sure that the action was propulsive and just moved through the book because I just took too much time. It was a bit too slow. It was a bit too... I'm trying not to say it was too British because obviously Britain is a fast country and is a fast moving country and things happen in Britain all the time. You know, I'm not making Britain out to be some sort of slow sort of backwater type place because it's definitely not for so many people. But, you know, that novel was, it was too slow. It was too, it was too contemplative. And even though it was about kind of weighty political themes, I just felt that it was too serious. So yeah, you can definitely see this, How to Kidnap the Rich as a sort of reaction to that in sort of my obsession with speed, my obsession with getting place down because that 2018 novel sort of took place in London and it took place in a kind of a the kind of modern London which when you get to the wealthy parts of London it's almost as if it doesn't exist it's almost as if there's just so much money that money is completely erased all sense of it being London so it just seems like pretty much anywhere else in the world so yeah so obviously how to kidnap the rich is it's about place and it's about speed and it's about heat and it's about spice so yeah definitely a bit of a reaction I feel and mm. um, I often find that the, you know and this is no surprise that the best writers are often avid readers I mean who are the authors and the books that you sort of look to for inspiration or are there sort of books that you perhaps reread when you need a, a kind of a reset of of both your writing and reading life uh so definitely 
probably one of my favorite books is by Akhil Sharma. So it's called The Family Life. Yeah. Um, uh, that is a book that I reread about like 40 times when I was writing How to Kidnap the Rich. Like a lot of times I had it open as a Word document. And a great thing about that book is that it's 50,000 words long, but it does a huge amount of stuff in that time. So that was definitely very useful to me to see what could be done in about 50,000 words in about 200 pages, just immensely useful. And even though it's really not anything to do with my book, it, it's about, you know, the breakdown of a family in New Jersey in America when the character's brother uh, becomes disabled due to a freak accident. And it's about him dealing with his life and him and his family dealing with that disability. It's a very, I mean, it can be a very depressing book, but it's also very, it's full of life. It's about what life is like in America for Indian immigrant families. So that one, hugely useful, hugely beneficial to me as a writer. Um, I like Chekhov. I like his short stories. They're, they're amazing. I love them. They're so good. Um, Arundhati Roy, definitely. I think she's a huge, I think she's a, she's a great writer. I wish she'd write more fiction. I wish she'd write more fiction. I want to see more of that from her. Mm -hmm. And who else? I, like pretty much, you know, when I was growing up, um, I was really interested in all sorts of genre literature, sci-fi, adventure, romance, detective, all of that stuff. You know, I've, re I, I've read like every single Regency romance book out there. <laughs> and, but obviously I knew that, you know, I'm an Asian writer, I'm an Asian male writer. I wouldn't really be able to get away with writing Regency romance or mostly, I mean, I don't think- I think I, you should try, I'd, what, I'd read it. I think you should try, go for it. <laughs> what, like kind of like Bridgerton with samosas or something? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but and science fiction obviously I mean it's quite difficult for Asian writers to make their ways in the world of genre literature so yeah I was always interested in this idea of literary fiction containing everything else in the world inside it and I think we're seeing a lot of that we're seeing a lot of science fiction and literary fiction come together you know especially because of Kazuo Shiguro who is again another huge person for me because I've always kind of felt he was a bit like, I mean, obviously he's a lot better than I am. He's a lot better than I am. I think as the awards and the acclaim demonstrates in his case, but I always felt that, you know, here, here was a person who'd come to Britain when he was about five or six years old and had found a way to write about the things that he wanted to write about while also talking about British life and talking about whatever it is that he wanted to talk about. Yeah. I mean, I think this is a whole separate discussion to have, but I do, I do think it's interesting that I, I do often find um, literature from people outside of the Western world who are perhaps born or have heritage from outside of the Western world do often meld genres a lot more than we do here and even you know as you were talking you were talking about reading crime and romance there are crime and thriller elements in How to Kidnap the Rich there's there's a, a love story uh, in there as well there's kind of all these sort of elements where you are blending various genres um, and I think that is something that that writers outside of the west do incredibly well and some of the most exciting literature that is that is being created at the moment is melding various elements and sort of not restricted by one type of like form which I guess I, I kind of feel like you weren't restricted by like oh well I'm sitting down and I'm writing this particular sat, you know, a satire and it's a literary book. I feel like you were kind of quite open to various other influences. Yeah, I mean, that's just, you know, part of when, when you're growing up in India and Indian families, your bookshelves have pretty much everything on them. You know, there's no sense of this is literary fiction. This is not literary fiction. This is genre fiction. This is not genre fiction. And I feel that, you know, for Western writers today, who've gone through that system of university creative writing courses and then MFAs and then sometimes working in the industry that they have a very industry based idea of what literature should be so they work in genres they work with certain word counts they work with certain styles that work best for them and I you know for me coming from a non-western background I have no idea of that I just write what I want to write and if it has about eight or 15 different genres contained inside it then I'm sorry for my publicity team find it more difficult to kind of <laughs> figure out what this novel is there's yeah. been a bit of confusion recently you know is this is this a comedy is this a crime is this a thriller and for me you know growing up and you know watching Bollywood movies and reading the books that we did when I was growing up 
you could do everything inside one work of fiction. You know, it didn't have to be just one thing. It could be everything. And I feel that this sort of obsession about genre and this obsession about these are the types of language that we need to tell these types of stories. I feel that that's just so limiting. And it, you know, it just limits the amount of global literature that can find a home in the West. Now, mm. For me, it's a tragedy. Yeah. I mean, I, it was remiss of me not to mention Bollywood because, you know, that's a perfect example of like a lot of Bollywood films are just, um, a, a lot of the classics as well are just a mishmash of like all sorts of things. Um, we're almost at the end of our time together. So apart from Bridgerton with Samosas, are you working on anything else at the moment um, that you can talk about or want to talk about? <laughs> Yes, I am. I am kind of mixing genres and I'm doing cosy crime set in Britain, Ooh. which would be very exciting. All the social excitements and commentary, but with a more British focus. And it's, yeah, it'll be cool, I think. I think that sounds very cool. Thank you so much for your time today. Um, uh, do check out the Bagley Foundation YouTube, IGTV and Facebook channels for all of the other interviews in a part of the Bottom Drawer programme. And all that's left for me to say is thank you all very, very much. And to everybody watching, please read How to Kidnap the Rich. It is amazing. Take care. Bye.